Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Monday, August 1st, 2016 City Council meeting. At this time, I will call the meeting to order. And uh, Pastor Janine from the Hosanna Lutheran Church, if you'll lead us in prayer. Thank you. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus who told Pilate that no authority is given unless from above. We thank you that you have raised up these leaders for their willingness to serve, uh, for the greater good, for the citizens of Watertown. Give them insight and wisdom, direct their discussions and deliberations, and bless the work that they do, uh, that they might be your instruments of good in this uh, community. Uh, in the state, um, and even in the world, Lord. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and do this work, all this, with grateful hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Janine. And Shelley, will you do roll call for us? I can. Albertson? Here. Bueller? Bueller? Here. Danforth? Here. Manti? Here. Riefenberger? Here. Roby? Here. Solom? Here. Thorson? Here. Tupper? Here. Billhauer? Here. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Shelley. At this time, I'll look for a motion and a second for um, approval of the consent agenda. Motion by second. Glenn, or I'm sorry, motion by John, second by Glenn. Any questions, any changes? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Number two, approval of the agenda. I'll look for a motion and a second. So motion by Beth, second by Mike. Any questions, any changes on this? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Number three, application for a transfer of location of a retail on-off sale malt beverage license for M&M Foxy's Incorporated doing business as Foxy's at 137 Fifth Street Northeast. At this time, I will open the public hearing. If there's anyone who wants to speak in favor of or against this, this is your opportunity. Hearing none, I will close the public hearing. I'll look for a motion and a second for discussion. So motion by Bruce, second by Mike. Any questions on this? W why is this considered a transfer? I believe he has an inactive license. No, it, no? any time that you move the legal description of a license, the state considered as, considers it a transfer. So it's... What? Uh, I've read this a couple times today, and i got to be honest, I'm real not, it's still not clear to me exactly what we're doing on this. Um, this, both of these licenses have been in place at the same location, correct? There's two licenses. A, okay. For, yes. So has, has this been going on errantly for a period of time or what? I just don't understand no, what. Not to my knowledge. Ryan, from do you want to come up and talk about it? Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't you come up to the speaker and. Uh, State your name too, Roger. Yeah. Although we all know it. Name, date of birth. Things like that, we just gotta know. Yeah. Roger Meyer. <laughs> My wife and I own Foxy's, and I think where the confusion comes in, um, when we bought Foxy's 11 years ago, it only had a malt beverage license with video lottery attached to it. And then I think within two or three years of that time, we purchased a liquor license with video lottery attached to it. So it pretty made my malt beverage license pretty much dormant, I feel, because the liquor license covered the video lottery machines we have. In um, some of the other places you've seen with dual licenses, like Midtown, Little River City, it's we're just activating those other licenses. And to do that at Foxy's, we had to make a physical address, like she said, to transfer it. And then on the casino side of Foxy's, I could have 10 machines if this transfer goes through. And on the other side, I could have 10 machines with my liquor license if I chose, which I do not want that many machines. We've talked about 13 is the number me and the vendor that I deal with has come up with. 
and it just to me it just utilizes that malt beverage license that to me kind of went dormant when I added the liquor license on top of it and that's kind of why we've got the approval and went through the deal to get the separate address and it's just really actually to add a few more machines to the business and they and they physically have to be separated yep okay any other questions Okay, if hearing no more questions, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Raj. Thanks for coming. Number five, proposed lease agreement with Chris Hanton for lots one. I'm, oh, here I crossed that off already, guys. I'm so far ahead of myself. We crossed Foxy's out of there. Number four, vacation of an alley adjacent to lots 2 and 19 and the northern halves of lot 3 and 18 within Lakeview Edition, block 2 as petitioned by Prairie Lakes Healthcare Systems. At this time, I will open the public hearing if there's anyone here that wants to speak in favor of or against this. Hearing none, I will close the public hearing. I'll look for uh, a motion and a second. So uh, motion by Bill or Randy and then... Dan, any questions on that? Maybe Justin, you want to fill us in just a little bit what's going on, or Shane, one of you? I can, Mayor. Um, this is the remaining portion of the alley that we previous vacated. Um, most of it, the majority of it, uh, the Prairie Lakes Health System is in the process of purchasing this lot um, that was n unavailable to them when they did their initial petition for vacation so <clears throat> they now have a purchase agreement um, and that purchase is pending here shortly both petitioners have signed it both Prairie Lakes Health System and the owner of this uh, property have signed the petition so there's no reason to deny it and we've brought it through the Planning Commission and now on to you with the recommendation to complete the vacation process and there will be no need to uh, maintain an easement for utilities because all the lots that were previously served by utilities are uh, no longer there. Okay, any questions for Shane? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Now we'll move over to number five. Proposed lease agreement with Chris Hanton for lots one and nine in the Hanton Industrial Park. At this time, I will open the public hearing if there's someone wants to speak in favor of or against this. Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. I will look for a motion and a second for discussion. So motion by Beth, second by John. Any questions on this? This is kind of interesting. Uh, we had already had some leases. One of the, there's actually two two pieces of property here, Justin, I'm gonna kind of fill in a little bit. And what had happened, we had like 13 acres or, and he'll give you the exact numbers. We had leased it for a dollar and then the other 13 or 17 acres, we had leased for $282 and something. What we did is we talked to Chris and said, what's the, uh, what's the chances of doing two thirds, one third on the bales so they can go to the zoo. The zoo needs the hay and he was all in favor of, and he will deliver that hay to, uh, to the zoo. So Justin, if you wanna give him the exact numbers for acreage and what's going on, it's all you. We, uh, if uh, I could first uh, have the screen show Shane's computer, quick. Will do, Mayor. Um, so what you see before you is exhibit A to the uh, lease, draft lease, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of difficult to follow, but uh, the lots in question are lot one, which you can see over on the right-hand side. It's a triangular, odd-shaped lot. And then a portion of lot nine to the west. And what we're talking about here is essentially this portion, you see where you have that sort of dashed line crossing there as a T. It'd be that portion of lot nine to the west of uh, where that T is. Um, yeah, in there and down to the west. So lot one, as indicated by the plat, has an uh, approximate acreage of 17.4, and that portion of lot nine, uh, which is, uh, again, hey, Shane. Uh, 
Can you put that on a different screen so we can see a, a, a oh. there you go. Bring that in so we can see exactly where it is. Some are asking if it's within the rail spur or out of the spur, and we just kind of need to know where that's at. Sure, it, and it is outside the spur. It's to the west of the spur. I can see if we can show you. Okay, so lot one is yeah. this triangular piece over here, and lot nine is a portion of this area. It's this area right in here. Yeah, that's, that's the portion denoted under the legal description there. That portion is approximately 17 and a half acres. Um, so if that gives you an idea of the amount of hay we're talking about. The term, uh, you know, in keeping with earlier agreements with the Hantons, uh, there's reference to the 2016 crop year. And just to clarify, um, that has a specific industry meaning. And for hay crop, that would be May 1st to April 30th. So it would be May 1st, 2016 to April 30th of 2017. Um, and uh, if the council so approves, uh, we'll make sure that uh, uh, Mr. Hanton knows exactly who to contact at the Bremel Park Zoo to deliver deliver the uh, hay. So, any questions for uh, uh, Shane or Justin? I, I'm still confused. This is all outside the rail spur area. Oh yeah, uh, you got the 20th Avenue there that goes. Uh, but the, east but doesn't it butt up against South Broadway though? On the, the the rail is all within this property right here. And this is a parcel over by. That's Lyles. South 81. I think that's Lyles right on the corner, uh, right there. That's Lyles, I yeah. believe. So we're right behind his. Okay. Okay. Huh? What is is it Lyles? Delisles. Delisles. Yeah, that's his business right there. It's right behind. And actually, we we have actually proposed that we can get an access off the of Highway 81 onto that property of ours because right now we have none. Do we not, Shane? The I'm. I don't think we do at right. this time. Yeah, we don't. So that's that's where he's that's where he's hanging it. Any other questions for Shane? Hearing none, I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Mike, the animals love you. At the zoo. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? Otters do not eat hay. Okay. Moving on. Number six, first reading ordinance number 16-12, amending section 21.0202 of Title 21 regarding zoning for the city of Watertown. This actually came up on uh, uh, kind of an interesting, interesting process that happened to the Board of Adjustments. And Randy, I'm gonna let you kind of visit about it just a little bit before we go too far, and then I'll have Justin fill in the, the real details. Uh, yeah, I did receive a, a call. I remember I was at that, that uh, Board of Adjustments meeting um, for some reason that day, and I remember this coming through, and then about 11 months later, I, I received a call from some neighbors down the street, and they said this guy's building a, a garage, but he's never been given permission to do it, so I went down there and visited with him that night, and of course the next morning I started following up with it, and he had been, he had received a, a building permit through the city, everything was done Every step of it was done on a legal on a legal matter. Nobody nobody stepped outside the the uh, the right. Uh, what happened though was the guy first went before the board of adjustments in May of 2015. At that time, it was tabled. Uh, they told him to go back and get necessary very or uh, permission for right away. Uh, 11 months later, he comes back before the Board of Adjustments, and it gets brought off the table, and of course, there was nobody there to oppose it. And he was uh, given the variance that he needed to build it. Actually, the garage is a foot and a half off the, the uh, adjoining property owner's uh, property line. Um, their question to me was, why weren't we ever notified? After I went through all, you know, checked with all the departments and everything was done right, why weren't we notified? And of course, that was my question. So I got with Steve and I got with, with Justin and I, I was really uh, kind of dumbfounded how we go 11 months and not notify before this came back up again. 
and it was it was like I say everything was done on the on the up and up I just thought that 11 month period was a little bit too long uh, you know the guy says well I don't I don't even get the paper you know so he thought it was a dead dead deal and all of a sudden the guy's building a garage in his backyard so uh, I think we've come to a pretty good resolution on this so I'll uh, let Justin kind of go over what his what our proposal is I should say and Thank you, sir. Um, as, as you know, uh, whenever we're talking about zoning ordinances and changes, there are protocols, generally speaking, about there being need for public notice, uh, there being need for the plan commission to take a look. This is a rather unique zoning ordinance revision because unlike most amendments this revision doesn't pertain to zoning district boundaries and so therefore isn't the kind of zoning ordinance that would need that kind of advance notice for public hearing as well as the plan commission to take a look at it um, and that's you know just for the record uh, per uh, revised Ordinance 2102-09 and uh, South Dakota codified law 1144 and 1161 subpart 11. Uh, this process in coming up with this language here uh, in, entailed going back and forth between the Board of Adjustment, between folks in city government, talking to you know Randy and, and Mayor Thorson and getting an idea of what all the parties felt was a workable solution that was number one proper notice to all the parties involved in the proceedings so that an incident like what happened there uh, that uh, Randy spoke to uh, wouldn't happen again but then also to ensure that you know efficiencies were had in city government that there wouldn't be a great deal of cost because mailing and mailing and mailing providing that sort of personal notice could get quite expensive so we feel like a happy medium was reached here I sent out a copy of the handout uh, which now is up on the uh, board and obviously background is more for the public um, as to what you know the Board of Adjustment is all about um, but I think it's important to point out as you know that the three main uh, processes that are spelled out in our ordinances for the Board of Adjustment are with appeals generally under Title 21 decisions made by the board or the the building uh, building official so appeals from the building officials decisions generally go before the Board of Adjustment in most cases there are some where that's not the case but the second is hearing requests for conditional uses and the third is hearing requests for variances now when we talk about notice there are two means for providing notice uh, one is publication which we have set out in ordinance clearly and it comports with statute that there needs to be that 10 days prior notice published in the paper of what the Board of Adjustments agenda is going to be the second is a certified letter to the adjacent landowners adjacent meaning next to either across a right-of-way or abutting uh, the property where the individual is seeking a variance or uh, seeking a, uh, a conditional use so those are the two forms one to the public generally one to the landowners most likely impacted by the decision of the Board of Adjustment so to address the issue that Randy brought up, brought up and you know to talk about what aspects needed to be handled in this revision the first here uh, depicts kind of what the current system the current uh, ordinance uh, provides which that there there is no requirement for when those certified letters need to exactly be filed with the Board of Adjustment and the certified letters have a receipt as, as many of you know as proof that it was sent to the landowner or to the person it was supposed to be sent to well under our ordinances all that was required is that the receipts be deposited with the board um, because in this process we came to find out that it wasn't the applicants who are requesting the variance or the conditional use that were sending out this notice but rather the city on behalf of the applicants we just decided that you know that needs to be provided in ordinance we need to make sure that ordinance reflects reality so first as pointed out here made sure that five days notice was provided 
with this certified letter, meaning the receipts would be provided uh, within five days of the hearing. So we make sure that there is that additional notice period. Uh, the second part is, like I said, ordinance now reflects that the city can provide uh, this notice uh, by certified letter and that, uh, and this is under the second bullet here, that uh, the applicant will reimburse the city for the notice, uh, for that particular type of letter notice. And so the other point um, that we had included in here uh, gets really to the heart of what Randy was talking about, which is that there was no procedure for notice to adjacent landowners when something was continued for a long period of time before the Board of Adjustment. And per Robert's rules, you can table something, you can continue it. There are a number of different ways to say, we aren't going to deal with it at this meeting, we're going to deal with it at a future meeting. Well, we initially thought, let's just see if we can, you know, make sure that we have to send out letters every time something's continued so that the adjacent landowners know when that, that uh, item has been continued to. And so they get a letter every time before the hearing saying, hey, you should be on notice. Well, realizing how expensive that would get and that that cost would then be placed upon the applicant, uh, started to realize that that would be an undue cost. Um, and so uh, with that, we thought a good compromise would be that the board would set a date certain at the meeting that they continue anything so that those who are there, the adjacent landowners that were already given notice to be there to contest something they didn't like, would then be on notice at the hearing that this was continued to a specific date. And should the board not provide that date certain, because obviously there needs to be flexibility, then they would be required to provide by first class mail a notice to the adjacent landowner before the continued hearing. Um, so that, you know, if it's continued to five, six, seven months, or whenever the Board of Adjustment wants to bring something back onto the agenda, they would have to provide notice five days in advance by, certify, by, by first class mail to the adjacent landowners. Okay. Thank you very much, Justin. So that was a first reading. This will be on your, uh, on your agenda next, uh, next council meeting. I think it'll be a, a, a good thing. I, I really do. I think that it'll allow people to be better informed that something's coming up. All right, number seven, consideration of contingency transfer to the police department to replace a heat pump in the amount of $20,000. Yes, $20,000. Uh, good evening, Scott McMahon, Captain of Sports Services, Watertown Police Department. Uh, the reason why we're here tonight is to ask for contingency funds in the amount of $20,000 to assist us in replacing uh, an energy recovery unit com commonly referred to as a heat pump. Um, do you want me to get more information on it now, Mayor? Or I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get a motion to second, and then we'll have discussion, and there'll be uh, tons of questions for sure. you. So I will look for a motion to second on this. Motion by Bruce, second by Beth. All right, any questions that you have for Scott? Go ahead and explain okay. a little bit further. Just Scott. a little bit more history on it. Since we moved into the police department in 2011, uh, we've had numerous problems related to air conditioning and heating issues. Um, one particular unit that's been a problem is this energy recovery unit or heat pump unit. Um, over the course of the last four or five years, we've spent about 4000 maybe a little more than $4,000, fixing leaks in the copper. And uh, most recently, over the last year or so, it's been more related to the compressor part of that unit. Uh, the whole unit as a whole has a one-year warranty. Uh, which of course expired a long time ago and then the compressor had a five-year warranty and uh, of course it didn't fail until a few months beyond that five years warranty. Uh, we have worked with two vendors here in town, local vendors, to try and uh, persuade the company that manufactured that heat pump to, to give us some kind of warranty on it. Um, however, those efforts were unsuccessful and, and also myself and, and others at the police department have uh, tried to get additional warranty and it, those efforts were unsuccessful. Um, so at this point, we don't feel that it's a good idea to invest more money into a problematic unit. Uh, more money would consist of a new compressor, which would be about $10,000. And the problem that we fear is if we put in a new compressor, 
we're going to have another copper leak deeper down inside this unit uh, that's not going to be able to be repaired easily or at all. And uh, then, of course, we'd have to replace the rest of it. So we feel it's in our best interest to um, follow the recommendation of a couple of local vendors, heating and cooling vendors, to replace that unit. Um, we did get two estimates. One was for an exact same unit as we have, and the other was for uh, a different product. I have called the mechanical engineer that designed our heating and cooling system in our building and spoke with him, and, and he assured me that either unit would be, uh, of course, compatible with our system as far as all the pressures and balances and things like that. So um, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. I do have the vendor for this heat pump or this energy recovery unit coming to Watertown hopefully yet, if not this week, next week, to um, just kind of look over our heating and cooling system at the police department, uh, make sure everything's compatible, and, and then, uh, of course, uh, we'll move forward with your blessings. So we are entertaining the idea of buying the same brand? No. 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 Okay. No. okay. We were given, I, I may have misunderstood. Yeah, you, okay. We were given two options. One was the exact same brand, and the other one was a, a different brand. And we're leaning towards the alternative brand. What yeah. was the price difference, Scott? Uh, there wasn't much price difference at all between, between the two brands. Uh, they're pretty comparable. What's the typical life expectancy of something like this? I mean, well, as you talk to these people, five yeah. years and a day, I suppose. Well, no, the, the life expectancy is supposed to be 20 years. Um, you're supposed to be able to recover your money after a little more than five years, uh, recovered through energy savings, because what this unit does is when it's too cold for the outside chiller, the big chiller outside to make cool air, when it gets below 45 degrees, that will not run. So then what this energy recovery unit does is it's got a um, compressor with Freon in it that produces cold air. And then of course, you know, we need cold air year round for like server rooms, computer rooms, things like that, that need cool air. So that's where you see savings. And then in the, like the fall and the spring of the year, um, where you don't really need the boilers to run or you don't need them to run as often, this unit will circulate that heated um, water through the system so that the boilers don't have to keep uh, running. So through that, you're supposed to get energy savings, and, and uh, after about five years, it's supposed to pay for itself. And you have had some humidity problems in there now. Yeah, as a result of the uh, heat pump not working for about the last four weeks, um, we've seen high humidity in the building, which, of course, is, is not a good situation. And uh, the temperatures have been higher than normal. We can't get a good balance or regulate the, the air conditioning very well because all it's running is the outside chiller. And uh, the heat pump is actually still circulating. It's just not uh, making cold air. It's just circulating what's coming off the outside chiller into the building. Scott, what's the brand that is faulty, not defaulted on this, and what brand are we looking at? Uh, the, the faulty version was uh, manufactured by Florida Heat and Water, I believe is what it's called, Florida Heat and Water. And uh, the new uh, brand is called an Envision. Um, the vendor for the Envision, um, like I say, they work with a local heat and cooling place, but uh, uh, the vendor is out of Sioux Falls for, for that particular unit. And that's what most of our, our local contractors do is they, they have a supplier um, that supplies the larger equipment for them. Any other questions for Scott? Okay, hearing none, I think I'll look for council action. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Number eight, authorization for the mayor to sign truancy agreement with the Watertown School District for the 2016 and 2017 school year. What I'll do is I'll look for a motion and a second for discussion since we still have Scott here. So I'll move. Motion by Randy, second by Dan. Any questions you have for Scott, or do you want to give us a little idea about it? Sure, just a little background on it for as far back as I can remember. Uh, the Watertown Police Department has served as the truancy officers for the school district. Uh, it's been a little while since I've looked up that particular law, but there is a law pertaining to truancy, which basically means that a, a, a child age student goes to school but then leaves school and uh, that makes them true and so at that point the school district has uh, you know contract with the police department to go and try and find that child and get them back to school and get them that education that they need so we've been doing that for as far back as I can remember any questions hearing none I'll look for council action all those in favor say aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carried thank you Scott you thank you
hey, you didn't do that back when I went to school because Dan used to come looking for me when uh, I wasn't in school. Yeah, I, Dan did a pretty good job at making sure that those middle school students were in school like they're supposed to be. So, but when Dan's absent, we'll we'll step in to take care of that. Scott, what do you on a truancy thing? Is it a pretty stable percentage wise of our school population, or are you seeing changes in that going up, going down? What are you seeing in the need for truancy at, based on historical? versus today sure well i think uh, watertown south dakota is kind of that gem of south dakota that uh, we have a lot of good things happening in watertown and one of those good things is we have a quality school district uh, that kids enjoy going to and uh, that's a that's a big plus to live in a community where we don't have some of those problems that maybe appear in other school districts or other places in the united states but i would say the uh, truancy number is actually fairly low and I would say it's not a real common problem. Um, probably most of the time when we deal with the truancy issue, it's a call to the parent's house and maybe one parent thought the other parent was gonna call the child in sick or, or whatever, or uh, in this case, maybe they had an appointment, so they left school to go to an appointment. Um, so those types of things, but not, not very often do we actually have kids that uh, go to school and, and just leave for the day on their own and, and uh, wanna go out and cause mischief. That's just not the case in, in my mind. Um, I think for the most part, we have quality students and a, and a quality system, so, yep. Okay, well thanks again, Scott. Number nine. Authorization for the mayor to sign a professional service contract with Aquatic Design Solutions, better known as ADS, for design services on the Splash Park project in the amount of twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Got Jay here. Jay, I'd like you to, if you could, you can explain what's going on and what we're looking at on this particular thing. Well, basically, the Splash uh, Park or Splash Pad. It can kind of go by either name. It's designed for younger kids generally. There'd be no standing water at this facility and it's just a play feature where there'd be different aquatic features. Some would shoot water down, some would shoot water up. Uh, quite often there's a mechanism where they can spray water at each other shooting it sideways. So it go, kind of goes all over the place. And uh, one of the big issues is we've been working on this project is to determine a proper location for this thing. And we've, uh, we've discussed a lot of uh, different possible locations, but the things we were looking for were a source for utilities, adequate parking, and bathroom facilities. And so now we're really looking at the McKinley Park area to the west of the, the Elks Lodge in the park there. You know, there's a lot of things going on there. There's a picnic shelter, there's a playground, so there's other things to do. A lot of activity in that park, always people there, so that's kind of a bike trail, yeah. So there's a lot of activity, so we just feel that that's a pretty desirable location for the Splash Park. <laughs> Jay, what is required for, the, I mean, is this just straight city water that comes from drinking water that sprays on them and goes down the drain and out to the plant or what does it treat it in any manner what's the well we want to design a recircul recirculation unit so that we're recirculating the water through the system and that's where the uh, aquatic uh, design folks they would uh, design solutions that's where they'd start with the recirculation system else if it's a flow through system that would require a very large volume of water that's basically a same type of situation as swimming pool it just i mean with all the yeah. filtering system and yeah, all that exactly so. and this is the same uh company that designed the uh current family aquatic center so jay i think one of the obvious questions is why don't why doesn't it go by the the current aquatic center just wanted to have it in another location in town, you know, and then the McKinley Park location, a uh, lot of summertime activities, uh, baseball, softball, that type of thing on the uh, west end of the community. So that would be have given pretty good access to the to the park over there between games and that type of thing. And we wanted to keep it as a free feature so that anyone could come and enjoy. Jay, the, the, the Park and Rec Board has, has discussed this, correct? Yes, they ha have recommended okay. approval. And then you and I visited yesterday briefly on this. What, what we're acting on tonight is really independent of where it ultimately might go. Correct. Okay. 
One of the things about the McKinley Park that we looked at also, we were concerned that it was in the flood way. This is um, uh, something that Jay can address for us, or I'm sure, sorry, Shane can address when you put it on his screen. He can show you the actual location, what the flood plain, what the, what the flood way is, and where there's um, possibilities. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it's easier to build in the flood plain than it is in the flood way, but you could actually put it in the flood way if you went no rise, am I correct? Yes, uh, we wouldn't recommend that option, but um, the yellow zone is the flood way, which has got the highest restrictions on being able to place uh, equipment in it. Um, there's appears to be a plenty of space outside of the floodway in this park that we could accommodate that splash park pretty well. And uh, it will um, certainly be an attractive piece within this park. So well, what size are we looking at? What, what are we getting close for, 150 by 100? Or give us a roundabout. I don't think it would. I don't believe it would be that large, but until we let the folks uh, start designing it, uh, you know, I don't know just what size it would be, whether it would be 50 by 50 or 100 is, by 50 or what. You gotta have some Isn't kind it kind of hard to tell them to design something without giving them a size? I, I mean, they actually have the, they got the dollar amount that they know what we could spend on a project like that. That, you know, we had budgeted for this for the year 2016. So I think it will kind of be designed around the play features within and what we could really afford on this project. But I mean, I, I guess I don't know how large it is either. I know I've looked at many, many, many of them online and uh, they look like fun. Oh yeah. I think for old guys like Mike and I and Bruce, <laughs> we could get out there and play in that. Jay, what, I mean, so I, is this something that's like activated all the time and it's doing its thing and, or how does this thing work? We can work? set timers up on it that, you know, I don't know if that's uh, 11 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night or however you would want to do it, but that's how we would most likely do it, that it wouldn't be on 24 hours a day, but there would be timers that it would be on for, uh, and it could be that it's like spraying water all over when there's nobody there. Huh? I think we can design it that, uh, you know, they'd have to be there to activate the features. The people would be. Yeah. I mean, so if they got there, they'd push a button like yeah. a sauna or something. Yeah. Or a, or a whirlpool or something. Yeah. Uh, do it, So what's the operating cost on something like this, just out of curiosity? Well, I've talked with uh, Jody from Aquatic Design Solutions and asked him that question, and he estimated it would be in that $6,500 to $7,500 per year range. Is there a lot of maintenance that goes with something like this, Jay? Not really. It would just be the water and running the electricity to run the pumps and chemicals and that type of thing. Hopefully there won't be a lot of, you know, maintenance. Uh, there's vandalism or anything like that. But, uh, Does this work with just like a storage system underneath the ground that, yeah, that filters yeah. it and like putting a swimming pool underneath and throwing it back up at you. Yeah. Well, this might really be a stupid question, but it, if this was located, it, it's a pretty good chance. That if this were located by our aquatic center, could the, could the water system that it takes to, to use this, could the current pool water be used and then recycled through its current system? So it's, is it the same chemical treatment, the same processing, because that goes through all that anyway, right? Yeah, it does. Would that, would that be the same thing that we're doing, that you use that water and recycle it through the system? Because we're already doing it. I'd really have to talk you know, with the I, I, aquatic I think, design people to answer I, that. I'm going to kind of address, because I understand where it's going. I, I don't disagree that you could probably use pool water to do this, Mike. I think you could use the same thing. The problem that we're running into uh, having it out to the pool area is that there's just no room out there for something this large. We'd have to get rid of parking space. We'd have to either uh, close a road, make some more parking, and we've talked about that. This is something that I think the public is looking for where, where mom can take her two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old or whatever, just ride their bikes down there and enjoy it, not have to go in and pay at the pool or even fight the traffic at the pool. So that's kind of why we're looking for something 
on this side of town versus taking it all down to the pool area. But I understand fully what you're saying. Have Have we looked out by the like Cook Complex? I mean, it gets pretty hot out there at the Ball Diamonds. I tell you, some of those kids would like one of those out there. I, I mean, just an idea. I don't know. It's a great idea, and I think that what's going to happen here is that this is going to go back in front of the park board. This is one idea where it can go. The park board is really going to come back with a suggestion of where it could go. We aren't making a decision tonight no. about where it's going. Uh, but that's been brought up. The cook complex is brought up. The pool has been brought up. McKinley's been brought up. The zoo has been brought up. There's just a lot of places where it could go. You know, you're going to be moving a lot of kids out of the parks that are going to go to Cook Complex this next year. So there, there could be Highland Park, could be Nelson Park. There's a hundred different places to go. And, and I believe the board, John, you know this. You're, you guys have talked about it. You're going to uh, be discussing a, a location. And I think once they get a handle on where it could go, they may very well say, let's use the pool. Well, and just they may, may very well want to talk to these people and say, like Mike suggested, can we use the same water rather than have a whole new circulation? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can have a bigger feature if you don't have to have that whole circulation process. So I think I think what we're looking for is, is uh, look for a design, let your park board go ahead and and, uh, and get on board and find a place to, to go with it. Are you guys okay with that? All due respect to Mike's, Mike's thought there too, but I like the idea of it being outside of the aquatic center part. It's just another attraction water oh, town. No, but uh, yeah, so no, and I know you wouldn't have it inside the, yeah. but I mean, even at the same, same place. I like the idea of it being totally someplace else, right. just as another attraction to the city of Watertown. So I, I agree, and that bike trail thing, I think, is really a important feature if they've how, got access. How dependent is the design of the location? You know, I, the utilities aspect of it would be very important because that would determine, uh, you know, how far dollars can go for play features. If you're spending an exorbitant amount on the utilities, that'll certainly limit what you have for play features. So the following question is, is if we design it without knowing a location, are we doing step B before step A or...? I believe but so. I think we want to determine that final location, uh, like the mayor says, with the park board. And also, if uh, we enter into a contract with him, you know, probably get him out and take a look at some of the locations and get recommendations. Any other questions? So if we, in our approving this, are we, are we going to await a location that's approved before we proceed with design is that what i just heard yeah. yes we would and so that's part of the condition of approval yes yeah because i think the board needs to make a final decision on where it goes and and i think we should leave the decision up to the board i mean they know best they, they work with this stuff all the time so that decision <laughs> <laughs> well, the decision has to be made where it's going to go before uh, we uh, actually decide something for Jay, it. Jay, is that kind of, I don't know, is that kind of the opinion right now of the board that that's, that's where they pretty much agreed that's the best spot? I know you, your comment was parking, utilities, and bathroom. That's going to eliminate some places it automatically. Because parking, you could, you could say other parks or whatever, but then you could only park around the block or whatever. So is this a decision for the most part been made by the park board as far as where they want to go is that i can't say that it's been made it's been discussed uh, you know like a complex has been discussed quite frequently too but uh, just want to try and do it right and put it in the right well, I don't, there's, for the there's no bathroom thing there unless you're going to open up the cook complex yeah, at the same yeah. time so one of the yeah. things you have to remember the cook complex you're going to get a skate park out there right well and the other yeah. thing too tournament weekends it's difficult to find places to park out there now without having to park a long ways away. yeah even with the new with the new space that's out there it <laughs> the people were parking it all the way up and down the ditches these last few weekends with the tournaments that were out there but, but I, I, just, I, I just want to question one thing or, or, and not that you know we we need to have the power over everything here but the mayor alluded to the fact that it should be the park board's decision i i don't know well, that's got to come back to you for approval though the, the, then that. then i'm cool with that you know, I, I i think it needs to come to the council Absolutely. for approval you know anything to this size has to come back to this board for final approval 
one of the things Bruce always mentioned, the bike trail and the advantages of that, and you're talking about parking and things like that. If you locate it in some place that's very accessible via foot traffic and bicycle traffic, then you are going to eliminate a lot of the parking issues as well. You know, if people can, because there's a lot of population in that area that could very easily use those bike, the bike path. Yeah, it's also very visible on Kemp Avenue in the McKinley Park location, and there are several daycares in that general area that would use it and that type of thing. But, but let me ask you a question about that location or a similar location. Let's pretend we go back to 1996 or 7 when we had the flood, and that's all underwater, and this is in place. What happens to this unit when that's full of water? It should be pretty secure, I would think. <laughs> yeah. He says, I know it's wet. <laughs> Do you fill it with an antifreeze or something? I mean, what happens to the system that drives this? That, that You know, and that's something I'd have to ask uh, Jody, but if the pumps could be removed, like in the fall and that type of thing, that they could be, the system could be winterized and some of the features stored. Mike, well, would you not think it's a sealed system? What, what, what would happen is... Um, that system would be completely flushed out of all water that was in it. It would be re-disinfected by adding chlorine and running the filters for a period of time. The water would be tested, and when it's um, reached the point where it's not uh, a hazard to the public health, it would no. be turned on and it would be back to normal. I think what Mike is asking is, if it floods and freezes, that's what we get here. It, is, that, is it going to be, be a shut down system? during that? We'd be able to seal it up and shut it down in that for the winter period, and it wouldn't come on and until nothing it's mechanical, out. no storage units or pumps or 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 the filtering system or the chemical system. Well, uh, all that's above ground. Well, uh, Mike, I really think you're getting way too deep yeah, into it. I, I think, think we need to allow the the people to come in and tell us <laughs> where the best location is this is going to be brought up to their attention that this is in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. we're going to know it's a great question but I think that's got to be brought up to these people so they understand our concerns you know flooding because flooding is a big deal for Watertown so, so again I'll ask the same question that I asked when we start this conversation I mean what we're acting on tonight we don't need to necessarily have a specific location yet to approve this I mean, I'm concerned too that we're getting the cart before the horse here. No, no, no. It says it right in there that we need to we need to get something designed for this thing, and they can design. They were going to give us three different designs for different areas. Okay. Is that not in the contract? Yeah, That's and you know where I'm coming here. from is to get the professionals involved to help us determine that. So, so, most so that professional fee will be the same regardless of yes. where we ultimately end up putting, yeah. the, putting it. Exactly. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this might be the best location in town, but the professionals are going to tell us, no, it's in the floodplain. You can't build it there. So, Just for clarification, the existing pool facility is also in the floodplain. But, uh, again, I think just for clarity, what this contract's going to do is they're going to take the budget that's available to them design as many positive features as they can into it, then we fine tune that system when we find out exactly where we want it to go and what the other ulterior costs are. You know, how long is the water main that's gonna supply the park? That kind of things. But this is really the launching point to get all the ideas formulated to see what fits in your budget. Jay, I would also just suggest that, because we've had I think a fair amount of success so far when we've had these projects like the community center, the softball, a lot of the things we've looked at ice, uh, you know, certainly if you haven't already done it, talk to some folks that have these things, you know, visit with a few of them, find out what challenges they've had, you know, what things they may have done differently. Cause I know in our tours and going through all the places that we did prior to building those facilities, we learned a lot. So, you know, if you can do that, I would, I, sure I would can. recommend it. Jay, what's the goal for, for starting construction on this and startup of the 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 feature well it would be ideal if we could get the project completed this fall yet I doubt if that'll happen I'm just saying that I think you'll get your your uh, design team put together and, and your location decided my guess is you probably will not do this until spring of next year 
that would be more realistic. I don't know. Do you guys agree or disagree? I, I don't know what the construction well, time yeah. frame is on something like that. It doesn't seem like it should be a real long construction time frame. But no. I think like once uh, some of the play features are decided upon, that might be a six to eight week window because I think they can make them as they go. Yeah, if I, everything's I, done and those added in the spring, yeah. if yeah. all you're going to do is build it and, and then secure it for the winter, you know, those, those features wouldn't have to be there. They right. could be done. But the everything ground wise and infrastructure wise i just can't imagine that's going to be a real long no. time frame no, for, for doing that so. actually so, i mean it's possible mayor that 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 part could get done who knows aberdeen brookings and huron all have splash parks there's probably more but those are the three that come to mind so if you want to take a field trip okay Play any has other one quick too. questions for jay Hearing none, I will look for council action. All those in favor I, uh, say aye. Uh, 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 do you have a motion and a second? Didn't I have a motion and a second? Well, I don't know. I don't have one written down. Okay. Well, let's, let's do it. I got one by Randy and Beth. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> and John. Okay. We're all in favor. All, all those say aye that are in favor. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Thank Jay. You. Thanks. I think this is going to be fun, and, and I... I Hope to visit with those folks when they come here and and let them know that we need the best location possible. And I think I'll, it's I'll make sure of that. perfect. Thanks, Jay. All right, Todd, you're up here, buddy. Okay, we're going to go on to number ten. Authorization for the mayor to sign an airline transportation system lease agreement with Aerodynamics Incorporated. What I'm going to do, Todd, before you get into it, I'm going to look for a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Bruce, second by Glenn. Now, Todd, why don't you light it up and let us know what's going on. All right, this is the uh, terminal lease for Aerodynamics Incorporated. Uh, this is all their uh, this parking space, <coughs> excuse me, the parking space, the, uh, the ramp space, and the internal structures uh, inside the terminal uh, ground lease. We copied uh, Aberdeen. I was working diligently with Justin. Uh, we copied a couple of different leases, but we stuck with uh, the meat and potatoes of what we had prior with uh, Great Lakes and Delta in the past. So uh, it's the exact same lease as we had with Great Lakes. Uh, we didn't change any, uh, any prices uh, due to we just didn't really want to gouge the new airline coming in. Uh, the mayor and I had discussed that uh, maybe in the future, uh, if they get the contract the, the next two years, uh, we can raise the rent uh, if, need, uh, if need be. So that's where we're at. Questions? And, and ADI has already signed this, I see. Is that correct? That is correct. Did, is this the same agreement we had with uh, Great Lakes? Yes. All the terms and everything? Correct. So this I, is just a replication of that with ADI? I, if I could, uh, Councilman Danforth, uh, the the terms in terms of the rates, the amounts of money transacted, uh, that's all the same. Um, the one item, well, you know, Lisa worked on this initially as well. Want to give her credit because her input was instrumental. Um, there were certain other provisions that were taken from the Aberdeen lease, most of which were additional indemnifications, additional what-ifs that were included in this lease that weren't included in the Great Lakes lease. So essentially what we added were greater protections that are standardized not only with Aberdeen, but we were informed that these terms were also being used at other airports uh, throughout the region. Correct. Okay, any other questions for Todd? We're that one step closer, aren't we, Todd? That's right, the 15th. All right, and I think Glenn's got a bet going on with me here, and Mike's got it on other things going on. And <laughs> holy cow. Okay, I need to... <laughs> no, hang on. Um, I do need to take and get some council action on this. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Todd, while you're there, just um, <laughs> fill us a little bit about how things are going out there, what you're hearing from ADI, what you're hearing from... Uh, other communities that are now using them or anything like that? Sure. I uh, had a chance to speak with the Youngstown airport manager, and service is uh, is a hit. 
there. Uh, they started off with just a couple of glitches with the reservation system and the federal government not getting the paperwork back to them uh, prior to about an hour and a half uh, to the first flight. Uh, but they did get everything under control and uh, got TSA involved and uh, got everybody on the plane and, and they, they got to do their inaugural. So uh, it's went off without a hitch. They're, uh, they're doing exceptionally well. No pilot delays, uh, no cancellations. Uh, they're on time every flight. What are we seeing, Marin, and what are we seeing for advertising and such? I, that's the one thing that keeps get is asked of me. Right. I, and I, have, I don't see uh, anything. I, I can kind of, I can touch a little bit on it, and then, Todd, you can touch further if you want to. I've been hearing radio advertisements that are going on that uh, uh, are, are being placed by, I mean, KXLG, I've heard radio ads on theirs. I know that today Megan is now on a, uh, a full scale that we're pushing this out. Uh, we did have a bulletin, uh, uh, actually it's a, uh, one of those big billboard. signs, billboard sign that uh, has been donated to the city of Watertown for two years that we're going to put uh, ADI and, and Watertown up there, our, our airport. So it's pretty darn exciting. So you're going to see lots and lots of um, advertising over the next three to six months on this thing to get it so that it works for us. I've heard some of the uh, travel agents in town in, in their advertising is also including it in. Yeah. And they're doing things that are, are they're, they're looking at making packages to go to football games and staying overnight in Denver. And it's going to get really exciting with uh, what they're planning on doing. Go Broncos. We just uh, kicked <laughs> off a marketing campaign today, uh, Megan and I, and uh, we got final approval today. We shipped it off to the, uh, all the radio stations in town locally and also up in uh, Millbank. So you should be hearing a lot of ads on the, on the radio. And I want to thank both the radio stations last week for taking me in uh, Thursday and Friday uh, and letting me explain a little more uh, in depth about the, uh, the company and how we book tickets and all of that stuff. I, I guess I've got a follow-up comment or a follow-up to, to, to Mike's question, too. I mean, you said you referenced you and Megan. I mean, is that something, I mean, it's just the two of you, or are we going to have more people involved as far as an advertising committee? Because, uh, again, if we expect this just to happen by itself, it's not going to happen. I guess I'd like some assurance, too, that we've got some plan in place for promoting this. Well, what we're doing is uh, we take the assurance of the Chamber of Commerce to market the entire city of Watertown. I would trust them to market our, our new airline. So that's who we're using, them and ADI. ADI is fully on board with uh, uh, putting out a marketing campaign. I don't know. Don't you think the Chamber can do it? Well, I mean, has this been discussed at Ling with them, though? Let's just not Absolutely. assume that they're going to be, well, be taking it on. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's been a given for a long time now that Megan is, unless you've heard something different, have you? But, but she's I, on board. But I am getting the question asked of me, though, that what, what by the chamber, in fact, I mean, what is our plan for marking this? That's telling me the chamber isn't necessarily totally I would, uh, I in would the loop on this. I would disagree with that 100%. I mean, I've had conversations with Megan, and today, and I mean, you're working with her. I totally disagree with that, and I may be wrong, but whoever you're talking at the chamber, um, they're on board with this, and we're going to get advertising is going to be out there you yeah, know also i might add too that we are uh, there is an intention to kind of of an outreach plan to go out to some of the area businesses and and kind of uh you know quell some of the concerns that they might have from our past experiences and and uh, try to convince them to to start utilizing this airline i'm actually looking to set up a meeting with spartan industries here in the near future uh to go out to their company and actually do a, a sit-in with them to explain all the process and just so you know, also, I think there's a ribbon cutting on the way back on the 15th at, at 2 o'clock, I believe. Megan has already got that scheduled for that. Yes. <laughs> That's correct. Okay. And we've done, uh, Megan and I have been in contact. Uh, we had a meeting, actually, the mayor and I, and uh, Bruce was there, and we had all the travel agents uh, and the news media. And, and the chamber was there, and, and that's the, the time when the there chamber well, said yes. they were going to take it on. This yep. was a month ago. Right. So we've been working very diligently uh, uh, myself with Megan uh, getting this marketing campaign underway. Somebody must be hearing about it because I have three friends that already bought tickets. So, If you have any questions, Glenn, uh, just give me a shout. We can discuss further. I, I have one more. Sure. 
When is our next? Are we planning another meeting at the airport board? We haven't had one for some time. Is there anything in the works? Nothing that I'm aware of. Do we need to have a meeting? I think we do. It's been a long time. <laughs> <Okay>. April. <laughs> What do we need, Shell? Okay, we're ready to move on. All right, thanks, Todd. Thank you. Number 11, consideration of change order number one to the contract with Kale Excavating LLC for the 2016 street improvement project, increasing the contract amount $2,712.50. I will look for a motion and a second for discussion. Motion by Beth. Second by Brad. Go ahead, Shane, fill us in. What's going on? Can you put my screen up on the... Okay, so <clears throat> this year's assessment project uh, named 2016 Street Improvements, project number 1601, included uh, curb and gutter, paving, grading and base on 12th Avenue between 14th Street and 17th Street South. It also included a portion of 15th Street um, going up to the north wh where it was the paving ended at the mid block. Um, a part of the work also included um, the, our miscellaneous storm sewer project for the year. Basically the storm sewer previously ended <coughs> at the west end of 12th Avenue and through this project uh, we wanted to extend the storm sewer over to the intersection of 17th and 12th Avenue to prepare for future work and be able to enhance the drainage through that area. <clears throat> in doing so, uh, we had a conflict, two conflicts with one is the sanitary sewer service that came out of this apartment building was fairly shallow and uh, our storm sewer had to come right over the top of it. So a small portion of this change order was work related to that. They had to pour a concrete pad to support the storm sewer over that sewer service crossing so that we didn't crush the service uh, with our new pipe. So that was a small portion of this, like 200 and some dollars. And then <clears throat> further down the line on, on the east side of 15th Street, the utility company has a primary power that crossed this road about here and then went down the same location where our um, pipe was scheduled to go. So they had to, our contractor had to stop work and allow the power company to relocate their cable. And so the bulk of this change order is allowing them downtime, uh, $1,500, and then some remold time or compensation to offset their loss of time and work. So uh, I did negotiate these prices down from what the original asking price was. So, uh, you know, we've, we've knocked this down as far as we, uh, as we could deem reasonable. And uh, I would recommend that we approve the change order. If there's any questions, I can answer. No questions? Okay, I will look for council action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. I will just add a comment that the work is just about done. Uh, essentially, some seating work needs to be done out there and uh, then some minor fix up on the concrete that got damaged by uh, while they were grading out the uh, um, boulevards and that's all work that the contractor's going to do under his own warranty. So we're, we're on the downhill slide here. All right. Any old business that we need to bring up? Mayor, I, it, it, technically it's old business, but, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about the dissatisfaction and the problems that are related to the the reseeding and the, and the boulevard work on 19th. And the only reason why I bring that up is you know, I just had a nightmare the other day that as we're driving down and seeing Highway 81 works done, that we're going to have this same problem and you're going to be inundated as well as are going to be some council people with uh, assuming that the work is even reasonably close to what was done on 19th. Um, I don't know if there's a way for us to be proactive in sitting down with, with the people that are 
running that project, and we cannot have happen what happened on 19th Street. That is completely unacceptable. It's outside of our hands other than to try to fix the problem in the end. But we need to reset a standard of, of what we need for the type of work that's being done in that area or for those types of projects when we come into residential and commercial areas. It's completely different than doing a highway out in the country. We've got to redo a ditch. Um, these are people's boulevards, and we have ordinances that require them to maintain them, but yet a lot of the work is, is not being done to a standard that's even acceptable. And if you recall, we had the same problem on Highway 20, what, two years ago? Biggest problem we had was this exact same problem. So we've had Highway 20, we had 19th Street. I can just see Highway 81 coming and having the same problem. Yeah, the, the, the only positive thing I can say about it, Mike, is that um, these were done with uh, STP STIP funds, and the DOT was in charge of those. We now have taken control of those particular funds, and the DOT will not be doing those projects through that. Now, granted, if there's something that is on coming up on Highway 212 or any of these other major streets, but this was this was really... I wanted to use a word there, but uh, this was bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Well, it was really bad. But yeah, Highway 81 gonna, is the state project again, right? I so went up there. It's a state project. I was up there the other day, and the weeds are already three foot high. And, and it is absolutely unacceptable of what's going on and how they finish a project. And, and Shane, I certainly hope that you are addressing that with them. We do not sign off until we're satisfied with the boulevards. Would you guys agree? But we just we've you we know we've had off. two big projects now that have been, for lack of better terms, I think they've been a disaster in the wrap up. I think the work that's been done has been good, uh, the project itself, it's the last little bit that that wraps it up has it's been a disaster. Grass. It's, it's hard been to terrible. Grass and gravel, yeah. yep. and that's what they used instead of dirt. They put in gravel, and that's what we're seeing. And it's hard to grow there. So no, I agree with you a hundred percent. My those those lawns are going to come back and haunt us. Those boulevards, I know they will. And they should. And we're addressing them. I right mean, now. and they should. And the problem is they should never get to that point. So okay. we got to talk about an expectation, I think, with them. And uh, apparently they're doing their work to their, to a, to a standard that is agreeable to them. But it, it isn't to the people that they are affecting. And, and rightfully standard. so. Pretty so, low standard, yeah. I would say. So how do, are you going to address Duly that? noted, um, we do have a weekly meeting on that Highway 81 project. And I will work with the project manager and his inspectors to ramp up their expectations of what, or anticipations of what our expectations are. And we'll try to head this off before it gets there to the point that we are at, yeah. uh, at well, with 19th. It's getting there now, so we need to go up and Well, the, something. yeah, the weeds are one thing. Rocks are, of course, a different one. And, and unfortunately, um, we've been outside of our seating window with the heat in the summer, but we're re-entering that shortly so hopefully um, sometime by mid late August we'll be retilling those boulevards and seating them and I will strongly um, try to emphasize that they need to get on that sooner than later I would suggest that was part of the problem know. last year was that the work got so late that they were in a rush trying to yeah. get it buttoned up I, I would suggest now that you've got Keith on board up there in building services that you, uh, you get him also or Roger or somebody that can be on them constantly to look at that because we, ca we can't accept it the way that it happened over on 19th. Do well, I, know? I look just on 19th Street, Mayor, at how much time, and I know, Don, you've been involved extensively and I've been involved extensively. Shane, you and your staff have been involved. We've had meetings on this. Mayor, you've been inundated. You've been out there. I look at how much time has been spent on this and... Heck, we'd been better off just sodding the darn thing in the first place, and it'd be cheaper for us. Um, obviously, that's probably not going to be the answer long term, but it, it seems like a relatively simple thing, uh, and it just has been a disaster. I mean, it's been terrible. So yeah, You would certainly think so. So there you go, Shane. Anybody else? I do have just a, yep. I just want to make a comment uh, on, regarding the sign ordinance. Uh, you know, we've had that... Uh, um, the first district has been working on that for some time now, uh, retooling that, and we thought it would be a, a little bit more of a simple process to begin with because we 
we were basically dealing with portable signs and off-premise signs to start with and then we found out some uh, other issues came to light with some other uh, communities around the country brookings apparently had retooled their ordinance um, it's mostly free speech speech issues which tell us that we can't dictate content on a sign um, well we can to a degree you know there are certain things we can certainly but um, due to that we've had to basically revamp a good portion of our our sign ordinance uh, first district I came to us with the first draft here just last week for us to review there are a number of questions uh, you know certain things that we're still questioning it, it appears that we're gonna have a couple of more I would say probably two maybe three more meetings to get this thing to, to where we we probably all agree on it the, and then the next step I believe and uh, mayor correct me if I'm wrong but I think we would bring this to a work session for the council for us to look at and then and I'm I'm a believer that we need to take this to the public that we like we did the first time when we worked on the sign ordinance some years back we had a number of people from the community you know people that make signs people that buy a lot of signs business people people from the community uh, and get them involved in this process. We don't have to drag it out forever, but we, we think it's necessary to do that to get those inputs. And then hopefully we can come up with a final draft to present to the council for approval. And uh, so that's that's kind of where we're at. And I'm hope, I think we've got another meeting scheduled for this week, I believe. We're going to set one up for this week. We're trying to stay on this thing and keep it moving. Thanks. Yep. 20th Avenue and Highway 81 south uh, there was another pretty bad accident out there by the ethanol plant on Sunday uh, a t-bone with a rollover where are we at with the with the DOT and how long do we have to wait before something very tragic happens out there at that corner right the DOT seems to run on their own time schedule and and uh, necessity on certain things like that I, I do know that we have been sending them the police reports, the accident reports, so they understand that these accidents are occurring and they're going to occur more frequently when Broadway is closed. Uh, they, they don't seem to have the uh, uh, feeling that we need to either to slow down traffic or do anything out there at this particular time. And it, it's a real struggle. So we are running it through Don and, and uh, you know, because he's on the DOT board and he can just give his suggestions for Watertown. Is there something you wanted to add on? I'll just say that they're again they're very data driven. Data's telling them right now that they don't need to, to do anything, but um, it's an ongoing discussion. And I just read about that uh, yesterday, so I, I will I will try and keep that ball in the air when I'm t discussing it with them. Yeah, because it's a big concern out there. You know, there's people that are are. Uh, you know, there's just just something that can direct people that you know there's a stop sign here and and hopefully it doesn't take a, a tragic accident to get any action done don is there anything our legislators can do to to push that forward to, or to make some kind of a provisional change in the meantime uh they could certainly uh, for lack of a better phrase apply pressure i mean they certainly could um i'd say if we're going to do that make it a coordinated effort you know, I mean, you read about that accident. We've been getting calls in this intersection since I've been in the council. Mm -hmm. It's it's speed. It's the, that's a wide intersection. So uh, it, it's unfortunate that that accident happened. But I don't. I guess I'd say a lot of people aren't surprised. So I think if we do it, I, I, and I, I I'd say sit. Well, I hate to say sit tight because that's what we're being told to do. But if, if we're going to do uh, get the legislators involved, I'd say make it a coordinated effort. It's kind of crazy. The other day I was coming down 81, and I was going to go east on 20th Avenue. As I'm coming up to the corner to turn left, somebody came on, on, the, on the west side of me on 20th and turned and started going down the wrong way and then came back into my lane instead of waiting for me to turn. Yeah, th there's a lot of push. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Part of it is, uh, in somewhat of a defense to the DOT, it's bad driving habits too. We've got some bad driving habits taking place out there, and you know things like that, and people you know making a run for it. That being said, it's that's a big intersection, and it's high speeds. DOT can't fix stupid. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, they can help, but they can. They they, they can. can. Well, I we, mean, they can't. Yeah. They can't fix down. stupid. But what frustrates me is this affects our community. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people within our community that have expressed concern to us, especially those obviously that have 
been T-boned or almost T-boned, which I'm one of them that was almost T-boned there. Um, so, if, so it frustrates me that there is a day when that roundabout comes that they are going to be slowing traffic down for the, so why not do it sooner than later? That's the part that frustrates me. But I do have a question. Is in the interim, and I'll call it the lack of action on, from the DOT standpoint on this corner, the one thing that I see coming from the east of us, we have, we have a turning lane, and we have, uh, that would, what would it be if I'm coming from the east, the right lane is for the traffic to go through or take a right, and then you have a left-hand turn. I'm not so sure that we shouldn't, in the interim, just get rid of all the lanes with the exception of one. Because what I almost got in trouble with was I was coming from west or from east to west going south, with a truck here. I can't see underneath, can't see around it. The truck starts because he sees traffic coming. My intuition at that point was there's no traffic because the truck's going. And so I take off and there is a vehicle there. He's timing it, I can't see it. I'm not so sure that that's not part of our issue out there, is that there, when there are issues of, of there, because there is so much truck traffic, truck traffic there, I'm not so sure that we shouldn't at least consider taking some action on our own, and that would be from the east and from the uh, the west on an interim basis. Scott, what are you guys seeing out there? Well, like the <coughs> is that on? Okay. Well, like Mayor said, uh, we are keeping track of the accidents that occur at that location. Um, the accident reconstructionists and me, or the collision reconstructionists. Uh, I never like to refer to them as accidents because there's always human involvement, um, and you know you can you can design roads, you can uh, do different steps to try and decrease those crashes. But in the end, uh, it takes a driver to make that decision to move that vehicle, and uh, for the most part, it's inattentiveness of the driver. And you know some of the things that you can do is is uh, roundabouts. I was a huge fan of installing the roundabout up on uh, 11th Street and 14th Avenue because I've done a lot of research on roundabouts and, and they've proven to have been very effective in, in reducing crashes rather than have a four-way stop or even a two-way stop where everybody kind of looks at each other and tries to decide who goes first. So, um, there, you know, there's different design um, things that you can do to a roadway to try and uh, decrease accidents, whether that's reducing speed or putting some kind of a calming measure in. Um, a lot of times you'll see that like in downtown streets, uh, you know, like Brookings and Sioux Falls, they have uh, little curb points that come out, some trees on them. Those are all calming techniques to slow people down. They're not just for aesthetics only. So um, with that 20th Avenue and 81 intersection, it is a very wide open road. Uh, the speed limit, I believe, in that area is 45, approaching it on, on 81 anyway, and I think it's 35 on 20th. But, um, you know, anytime you start getting speeds at 45 miles an hour or faster, the, the chances of injury is substantially greater than at 25, like on any residential street. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, the engineers are telling us that 45 is is an accurate speed for that roadway and that might be for a four-lane highway um, but uh, you know anytime you can decrease that speed it certainly helps um, you know there's like I said there's different calming measures that we could look at but in the meantime I think uh, you know continued uh, awareness of that intersection continued future planning as far as what we can do there from a design um, design method. Um, I guess I'd be cautious about changing up the pattern of the roadway on 20th Avenue just because people have somewhat become accustomed to what's there and if you implement change some people aren't looking at what that change is and I, I would be fearful that it might create more crashes. So I guess I would uh, recommend you know um, I know there's some thought about a roundabout there at some point in the future in 2018 whenever that would yeah. be but in the meantime I would guess uh, I would recommend um, you know, visible presence from the police uh, to include the Connington County Sheriff's Office and South Dakota Highway Patrol, as well as us, uh, putting speed board trailers out there uh, to bring some awareness of the speed issues. Um, you know, uh, you can always uh, paint some things on the road to try and capture a driver's attention to stop ahead. Um, you know, put a little warning light above the uh, stop sign that's a red flashing light, things like that. There's all kinds of different measures that you can do to try and gain that driver's attention because every crash uh, is a result of a driver's inattention. It's not the vehicle that causes the crash. It's it's the driver. 
I have any of these people, they haven't been running the stop sign. They've just stopped but pulled out at a wrong time, no, correct? No, I so think the last one, Brad, I think it was a, uh, a ticket issued for running a stop sign. Not even failure, not even stopping. Failure to stop. Failure to I yield. Yeah. Yeah. And a failure to stop that, I mean, they might have stopped and then proceeded. That would still be a failure to stop. I think reading situation. the police report, they did stop and yeah, then That was my understanding, too, yeah. that they did stop. But um, in any event, uh, you know, if you pull away from a stop sign and there's traffic coming, uh, unfortunately, that's a, that's a criminal law violation. And, so. and I think that's what people are having problems with, judging the speed of 45 miles an hour. They're used to driving other city streets, other city highways, four-lane highways that are 35. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got this car coming. 10, well, it's 50 miles an hour out there, I believe, so 20 miles an hour faster. Yeah. And yeah. A lot of times, you know, uh, the general public or the general driver doesn't think about how fast the car will travel in feet per second. They're just kind of, well, I know I'm doing 45 miles an hour. But you start putting that into reconstruction terms, like what I used to do quite a bit of, um, that really changes things up when you can move a vehicle coming from two different directions and call it feet per second and velocities, uh, you start looking at that kind of thing, it, it really um, makes people more aware of what can happen. So I think education on the intersection, um, you know, presence, police presence, and and uh, just continue to try and make it safe because that's what we're in the business of doing is public safety. And, and we certainly have a vested interest in providing for public safety. I would like to see some, some flashing yellow lights too, something that, you know, caution, dangerous intersection or, or One, something uh, out there. I, think I know the DOT doesn't want them out there, but I say we just put them out there. I, I know people are, so people are coming down on us as a city. Yeah, we're about two years out <clears throat> for I, uh, completion of the work, so. I think a little bit of it's the size of the intersection, too. People are accustomed to a smaller city intersection, and then all of a sudden now they're into a, basically a four-lane intersection in all four directions, so. But, you know, you're, like I said, whenever you change driving patterns, uh, 29th Street, when Walmart was first built, we had a lot of crashes at 29th Street and 212, um, and some of those being fatal crashes. Uh, part of that is, is people were just used to just driving 45, 50 miles an hour into town and not thinking about any side traffic or thinking about a stoplight being there, even though it's hanging right above the road. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's habit. It's driving habit. It's the inattentiveness on behalf of the driver. And, and uh, that's why I say, it, you know, I'd, I'd be hesitant to change road design or anything like that at this point. I just, I just want to say, too, it, it, Mike's scenario that he almost said he got T-boned, uh, someone I work with, her son had the exact same thing happen to him. Same spot, same scenario. Um, those are things we can control, at least in the interim, until. until sure. And I, honestly, I think Mike's got a great idea, I think, on s making a single lane traffic there. So you don't have well, that extra that, lane. That, I think that's not a bad, I don't think that's a bad idea. The well, problem with that is jamming up the traffic. I mean, you're going to have a serious problem when Broadway's closed there. You're not going to have any way to get that traffic to go when you got somebody trying to make a left turn I, and there's traffic coming yeah, and, and I think that makes it all more important to me. Well, I think, I, I think just the opposite because here, if you're going to jam up traffic, people are going to be more apt to be in a hurry and try to shoot across that intersection. Okay, so go. I, I did, guys, I'm going to move on on this. So Can I just, just let me finish here. Okay. Uh, Shane, I sent Rob a note to get some flashing yellows out on 20th Avenue so people can be aware of the stop sign. I don't know if we can put them on Highway 81. If we do, someone might tell us that we've got to take them down, but we should consider it. And uh, you do have an issue that you want to start talking about on Highway 81 and 20, do you not? That's going to take a little bit of time, guys, so I really got to get moving. Uh, was there something we hadn't talked about? I just only want to ask Scott. You mentioned the roundabout. What is the traffic scenario accident-wise been on the roundabout? You know, I'm not exactly familiar with those numbers, but I know we haven't had a lot of crashes there. And when we do have crashes, uh, you're talking usually just uh, uh, minimal property damage. You're not talking injuries to uh, passengers and that sort of thing. So that's uh, that's I, the purpose. I can kind of tell you what I've heard on the roundabout so far is that uh, one of them, an accident was, is a, a street light fell down into a guy's pickup. <laughs> Dead serious. <laughs> yeah, street light fell off and r fell into a pickup. That happened. And then uh, there was a couple pop tires, I think, that happened this winter. And that's the only things that I've heard about. Yeah, Other than that, I really haven't heard of 
a lot of uh, a lot of problems. Yeah, it's been a great tool having that round out there. Yeah. And then we'll get that. So Shane, if you want to slide into 81 and 20 there, we'll get going on that. I will. I, I was just going to say it is so ironic because uh, my my next item is um, I didn't get it, have it in time to get it on the uh, agenda in the proper way, but <clears throat> we are working with the DOT and in their footprint of the new roundabout will impact several um, manhole facilities that the city has within that intersection. So we're going to reconfigure our gravity sanitary sewer system within that intersection to accommodate their new footprint. And we want to do that and include it in their plans, but we need to have our design plans done and submit to the DOT. And so the sooner that, that I can get a consultant hired and on board to do that design, the better. So I, I put before you each t tonight a uh, copy of a professional services agreement with Howard R. Green, who has been recently doing a lot of uh, infrastructure projects for us out at the wastewater treatment plant. And uh, Mike Berger's been very satisfied with the work that they've been doing for us. And so we reached out to Howard R. Green to assist us in redesigning the sanitary sewer in this intersection to uh, fit the new footprint up when the roundabout is constructed. Uh, the timeline for that is, is that design, the DOT is at the, towards the finishing it, portion of their design work on the intersection. It is going to go through a rigorous design review on their end. We're going to include our plans within their theirs and bid it at the same time and do all the work under the same project in 2018. So bids are going to be taken uh, in fall of 2017 and with the construction in 2018 and we want to be on board with that project with our plans. So Shane, are you looking for action? From I am. Plan? I'm looking for action to enter this professional services agreement with Howard R. Green Company. Their uh, estimated fee is $19,800, which seems very reasonable for a project of this scope and, <coughs> and, um, and not expedition yeah. rate. Right. So what I'll do, uh, Shane, is I'll look for a motion and a second for discussion. Demo. Motion by Brad, second by Randy. Any, uh, any questions you have for Shane on this? Shane, what coordination do you have to do with the DOT on that? Well, a um, couple things. We have to have our own um, certain aspects of that our design won't have to include is detouring, um, traffic control will be largely all taken care of by the DOT. Uh, you know, we'll have uh, certain things. I mean, we, we'll have sanitary sewer construction plans and specs that they don't do because they don't have utilities on their work typically so we'll we'll prepare a set of drawings and specifications related to the utility work and submit it into their plans and then uh, so we do say we will realize some savings by piggybacking into their project but uh, and then we we have unique um, portions of the project that they won't touch so does that answer your question are they gonna have to coordinate then which, I mean, <clears throat> tearing up the sewer, obviously, it's going to, somehow it's going to have to be maintained. Right. So yep. uh, it's not like you can just dig it up and come back and right. wait well, a week and get the other side. It's all. Correct. They have a temporary road that they're building through the part of the parking lot over here that comes back onto the r road over here. So we'll, once they get that traffic rerouted, we'll dig across and get our sewer out of the way as soon as we can. So. It'll be a very good coordinated project. Have, have you seen plans for the detour? What what they're thinking on doing? Well, they're going to try to allow traffic through the intersection as much as possible. But there will be times when a detour will probably be needed. But for the most part, it's going to be have some traffic through the intersection at all times. At, at 55 miles an hour right through there? No. They, they will slow down for construction, John. But... They are reluctant to change the speed at this time. I, I will acknowledge that. So, any other questions? Any other questions for Shane on that? It's good that we're, we're working with them on uh, and getting this done now. 
So I will look for council action. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mayor, I have just a, a comment about a, I went to a gathering out at the event center a couple of weeks ago that Captain McMahon and others were there. And I just asked him, it was 650 or more people. And I just asked him, what would make you feel safer? And he said, well, his belt. And we said, well, that's probably not an option. But when you put 650 people there, what he did say was if they could use their radios that are assigned by the city. So if something were to happen, he wouldn't be fumbling for his for his cell phone to try to make contact with emergency of some sort. And when you put that numbers of people, you could have something happen. And so I just said, well, why don't I bring it up? I suppose the belt is not an option even when it's our officers, because we've talked about that. But what about the use of yeah. the radio? You know, we talked about that, I think it was probably two years ago or so when we, when we went through that. I would recommend, Justin, that you readdress that for us and, and take a look and see what the officers can and cannot use as they're out there, because I don't believe you are uh, a city employee as you're out there representing somebody else. Am I correct? That's correct. I'm actually an employee of the event center at that point. Um, I do have to follow my sword a little bit here, Dan. I did talk with the chief, and, and he said, well, you know, we did kind of have some of that discussion when we were talking about wearing uniforms and that sort of thing. And uh, he reminded me that, well, you, it's okay to, to take your radio. So uh, it's something that uh, had been a year or so ago, and, and that completely um, passed by me. But, um, yeah, he's okay with us wearing the radio. So, Don't you have guns, John, out there that you could yeah. give to them? Uh, they don't allow me to carry one on premise. <laughs> <laughs> Any other liaison member reports? I do got one. Uh, through the Watertown Area Transit. Recently they just had the DTA meeting, which is the Dakota Transit Authority, which is state of South Dakota, North Dakota. Watertown Area Transit, the assistant director, Wendy Klein, was named support person of the year. Uh, Prairie Lakes Hospital in Watertown was named... Uh, Friend of Transit for the 50 Transits, and Watertown was also named the most innovative transit of the state or the DTA. Uh, just a, a little heads up, Terry sent me an email today. Uh, we're up about 10,000 rides for the year compared to this time last year. Total rides for last year was only 44,770. So to be up 10,000 already this year, they're doing some some great things over there so hats off to those guys so mayor just the fact we had a grand o or a ribbon cutting yesterday for the golf course for the set the third nine that had not been opened and seemed to go very well so i think that's a positive it was it was a, an extremely fun time out there yesterday afternoon uh, we had a ribbon cutting for the yellow course it had not been played for almost exactly a year. I think we closed it on August the 2nd and here it was open on July 30th or August 11th and July 30th, something like that. But Mike, I wanna, I wanna just mention um, some names on that and, and help me if I forget anybody, but it was, it was Mike Danforth, his brother Tim Danforth, Steve Wyseth, uh, Murphy was out there, Levi, Todd, um, and Pat Shriver was on that on that committee. And I tell you what is so nice is that um, most of you know I'm not a golfer, so I, I, I really didn't have a handle on what they needed out there. But every one of those guys that we put on that committee that worked on that thing worked hard and worked day in and day out on that and worked with Dunnick's extremely close, made some changes on it, and you know it went really well. And yesterday the people that were on there were just thrilled with the way that that course turned out. It might be a little slower than they were expecting, but with the new grass, um, yeah, it went really, really well. So thanks to the committee for doing that. It was a, a great job. Well, and it, it's really going to be a fun time for the people that partake out there at the golf course. But, you know, I will say, too, that, you know, to give Todd and his staff um, a lot of credit for that what they did. There, there's, you know, you take that 
course out of commission which frees up some labor and such but you know the construction project like that demands a lot of time and, and between Todd and Jeff Elkin and this staff I think they did a really really good job uh, yeah saved us a lot of money on it outside of the quoting otherwise we'd have been over budget on it, it so it did and, and I think you'll kudos notice, to them uh, it'll notice in, in this year's budget you guys will get that budget tonight I believe and then uh, you'll see that we did include some dollars I believe it was a hundred thousand dollars that we've included to finish the yellow course up and the reason that we're looking for that is in the sand traps and, and people are paying hundred and fifty dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars for these sand wedges and they're banging rocks out of there so we need to get them cleaned up and finished and then the yellow will be done we'll skip a year and get a couple of things done on red and and uh, so forth so it should be really good I just like to say we, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, thank uh, acknowledge and congratulate the new Watertown Hall of Fame inductees that'll be coming uh, in this fall uh, Lou Rodershot who unfortunately passed away last week uh, Ernie Edwards and Joy Nelson uh, thank you to what they've done for the community perfect I also would like to mention I think uh, Scott August 2nd is that like tomorrow national night out I would invite everybody to try to come over and enjoy tomorrow evening maybe you can tell us what's going on Sure, come out tomorrow evening at the police department this year, right across the street here from City Hall. Uh, I believe it starts at around 6. Uh, the FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, will be there serving um, hamburgers, hot dogs usually. And uh, there's just all kinds of different community um, groups that will be there. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be a good fun time. The weather's supposed to be good. So please do come on out and, and see what's going on at the police department tomorrow. Uh, Attorney General Marty Jackley is going to be in attendance. That's I understand. understand. Attorney General Marty Jackley will will be helping with the food <laughs> items. So I'll come as long as you guys don't make me get in the donut eating contest. <laughs> I always lose. And then I also want to thank Scott. You appreciate bet. it. We'll have fun tomorrow night. And then I would also like to mention that uh, I think Shelley, you're handing out the budget books tonight, and our budget hearings are starting August the 9th at 6 p.m. and August 10th at 6 p.m. We'll expect them to run uh, anywhere from three to three and a half hours every every night for the next couple of nights on the 9th and 10th. So bring some of that. I've seen, Mike, you kind of drink some of that um, go juice once in a while, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Caffeine, caffeine or something like that. So bring it along. Any, anybody else, anything else? Shelly, you got anything you want to throw out there? All right, well, thank you very much. and. If there's nothing else, I don't think we have any reason to go into executive session. I will look for a motion and second to adjourn. Motion John, second by Glenn. All in favor say aye. aye.